Good morning and welcome. I'm Pastor Fred Baltz, pastor of St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Galena, Illinois, and uh, this is chapel for the Institute of Lutheran Theology. Um, before I go further, I uh, just would say that uh, you may be heard the old saying, the person with one watch always knows what time it is, the person with two watches is never sure. Uh, that's true. I've learned that this morning. Uh, in an effort to be punctual, I've been looking at the clock in the lower part of my computer screen, thinking that that must surely be coming from the internet and must be absolutely accurate. But I thought it seemed strange that it wasn't with my watch because I try to keep my watch accurate and I looked at a network television program as I was waiting here and they give the time as well which you would think would be absolutely accurate and it was three minutes different from what was in the lower part of my computer screen so I've tried to kind of uh, split the difference here and start somewhere in the middle and uh, if uh, if you are just joining and uh, wonder why I'm already talking because it seems like it's 10 o'clock right now, well, uh, hopefully you heard the explanation and uh, we'll, we'll uh, have everybody on board here in just a moment. So let's begin with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as this new day begins, we indeed give you thanks. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Son. And in this world, uh, we ask that we might truly be sent and be there for others, just as you are always there for us. In Jesus' name, we pray this. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to uh, read to you from the Gospel of John in the fifth chapter. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. I'm going to conclude the reading there. There is more to the story, and we'll perhaps uh, touch on that as we go, but that's uh, the part that we're going to really uh, focus on now. I think that many people in our ILT Chapel audience uh, would have some familiarity with the old city of Jerusalem. I think a lot of you are pastors, though many are not. And uh, if you could see uh, the old city from the air as it was in Jesus' time, you'd certainly see the the uh, great temple 50 acres plus and uh, that would be overshadowing everything in the city but uh, then there would be a relatively small city surrounded by walls you'd be able to see the streets you'd be able to see some pools now we uh, we heard as I read the gospel that this place called Bethesda had five roofed colonnades. So if we were looking down now from above on the old city of Jerusalem, looking for something with five sides, a pool with five sides, we would look and look in vain. And that eventually led some people to think that there never was such a pool, that uh, John was um, perhaps just uh, exaggerating or or had some information that wasn't correct. <coughs> Excuse me. But in the 19th century, the discovery of the pool uh, was made, <coughs> and it was recognized. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry for that. It was recognized 
that the colonnades formed a rectangle around two pools actually with another colonnade separating the two pools so you had not a pentagon but you had a large rectangle and five colonnades as part of that now what's more the location of this pool was very near that huge temple we were talking about before and very near the fortress of Antonia which adjoined the temple in, 19, in, in the 1960s uh, further excavation was done there and signs began to appear that this temple excuse me this uh, excuse me this pool with its colonnades was a shrine it was a shrine to Asclepius and that the soldiers who of course were not Jews and <clears throat> did not honor the God of Israel <clears throat> went to this nearby place and used it as uh, a, a site, a, a location to worship this god and, and it was especially important uh, for prayers for healing. So when Jesus walks through this area near the sheep gate on his way into the city, we could say that at least from a religious and theological standpoint he's in a bad neighborhood he's in a place where people are coming to pay homage and offer prayers to a foreign god an idol and this in the in the very shadow of the temple to the one true god in the verses that follow which i did not read uh, jesus says to this man later whom he heals he says, sin no more that nothing worse happened to you. And I think what he's referring to is, don't worship idols anymore. But think of this man. He's desperate. For 38 years, he has been paralyzed, unable to walk. Now in the manuscripts of John, as we have them, uh, some of them sound as... I read to you with no reference to uh, what happens with this water really but other manuscripts which really are not probably manuscripts as John wrote them but manuscripts that supply some of the local information that help us understand further they say that there was an angel that came and troubled the water and the first one in was the one that was healed that probably does reflect the kind of superstition that went with this Bethesda pool. So, this poor man, looking in the wrong place for his help, and unable to get to the water in time, is frustrated and probably there begging. This has got to be a terrible, pathetic, sad scene with many such people all around this pool. Jesus says to him, Do you want to be healed? Jesus comes to the one that no one has helped before and asks him if he wants to be healed. And of course the man does. But he says, I just have no one to help me. Now Jesus does a very interesting thing and I see this in Jesus at other places at other times. I see it in the Old Testament too. Sometimes God challenges us and by meeting the challenge we demonstrate our faith. For instance, let's take another story from the Gospel of John. The story about the healing at the pool of Siloam. Recall that Jesus put mud on this man's eyes and then said to him, go across town, cross the city now, find the pool of Siloam not just any pool, not just some water that you might have in a jug, but go to Siloam and wash it off. That's, that's going to be hard to do. That's going to be a challenge. But if the man will do it, he is showing that he has trust in Jesus, that it goes with the faith, you see. When he got to Siloam and washed off the mud, his sight was there for the first time. In a similar way, I believe when Jesus says to this paralytic, get up, he's challenging him to 
step out, in a matter of speaking, on faith. Because for the man hearing this, hearing Jesus say, get up, stand up, his first thought must be something like, don't you understand, Jesus? That's exactly what I can't do. But it's what Jesus has told him to do. And by trying, by making the effort, he's going to demonstrate that he has faith. He does have the faith. He attempts to get up, and he stands. And if we look at what Jesus says to him, we can, we can paraphrase it. Get up, pick up, and move on. St get up, that is stand up. Then pick up your bed. Pick up what's there that's yours, that's around you. And go ahead, move on, walk. I believe that this story is not only a wonderful story in its own right, a story about Jesus and his compassion and his power, but it is also in a way a, a parable because we have people like this paralytic, people in our time, people all around us, and his story could be their story. They are paralyzed, not in a physical sense necessarily, but paralyzed in other ways. Some people are mentally paralyzed. They have no direction. They don't have any goals. They have nothing that they want to accomplish in life. And they're called uh, lazy, I suppose. And I'm not uh, here to talk about making judgments about such people one way or the other, but just to establish that there are people who are mentally paralyzed. They have no direction. And I believe that if someone brings Jesus' message to them and helps them understand that he's saying to them, get up and pick up and move on, they can discover that if there's anybody ever who had positive and wonderful directions for a person's life to help them move ahead and accomplish great things, make their life count, that would be Jesus. That would be Jesus when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And there we know there are so many ways to do that. There are some people who are emotionally paralyzed. And that can take many forms, but especially I would mention this morning the paralysis that we call depression. Again, we can talk about whose fault it is, if it's anybody's fault, if someone becomes depressed. I don't think that really gets us anywhere. What really gets us someplace is to recognize this happens to people. And the sign of depression is not necessarily feeling sad. That's why many people are depressed who don't know it. Depression shows in other ways, and one of the chief ways is an, inabil an inability excuse me, to get things done. An, Ill, an inability to even start. There's that paralysis, but this time it's an emotional paralysis. We know that doctors and their medicines can help overcome the symptoms, but at the root there still are reasons why this happens to people. And I believe that the Christian congregation, people speaking for Jesus and reaching out for Jesus as his hands can put an arm around the shoulders of the depressed person and can help that person too to regain health, to, to get up and to pick up the pieces of life and to move on. It'll take patience, I think, but it can happen. Then I think that there are people who are spiritually paralyzed and one of the forms that takes I believe in some people is they look to a past that they have lived which is a disaster they've called they've caused much grief and harm and pain and suffering by the things that they've done and the things that they haven't done and so when they try to balance out their life looking ahead at what's left for them to do on this planet they conclude it's just hopeless. I've made such a wreck of things, such a disaster of things. Uh, why should I try to even uh, begin to compensate for what I have done? There are people like that and there are people who perhaps feel that way even though uh, according to human judgment they 
don't seem to be all that bad, but I've learned as a pastor that there are many people who sit there in the pews who have things from their past that come back to haunt them, and they need help sometimes. Uh, they need help to be forceful with their own selves and to say, Jesus has forgiven me. Who am I to stand in the way of that? I have to learn to bury the past and realize that my sins are forgiven by Christ, by God, so I must not keep bringing them up. People like that can be paralyzed. But if we can bring them God's word, if Jesus can speak through us, they too can get up and pick up and move on. Like the man in the parable, or excuse me, not the parable, I called it a parable, and it is in a sense a parable, but I mean the man in the original gospel story, like him, many people today are looking for help in the wrong place. They're not looking for help from the true God and from Jesus Christ, his son. They're looking in alternative places that the world holds up as the, the, the great answer. And uh, something worse can happen to them, as Jesus says. Now you heard uh, that this happened on a Sabbath and what follows is discussion about the Sabbath. That this man shouldn't be carrying his bed on the Sabbath and then Jesus shouldn't have healed him on the Sabbath. Well, that comes from one particular interpretation that was, of course, common then and common now among, among devout Jews. We are not to work on the Sabbath. That's the commandment. And healing is working, so healing shouldn't happen on the Sabbath, nor should carrying one's bed. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, don't work on the Sabbath. What constitutes work is an interpretation now of the Pharisees when they say that Jesus and this man are both guilty. Jesus, of course, disagrees with that and finds that healing someone on the Sabbath is honoring God on the Sabbath and is a good thing to do rather than a bad thing to do. And he says his father is working still and so is he. We must be so thankful for that, that the Son of God is still working, working through the Holy Spirit in the church even now, even this minute, in the United States of America, in Canada, around the world, in Ethiopia, and South Sudan, wherever the church is, wherever two or three are gathered in his name. And what a blessing it is that we might be a part of his healing work as we confront the paralyzed people of our time. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we do indeed thank you that we are the body of Christ and that Jesus still travels through this world and in a sense through us in the good neighborhoods and in the bad neighborhoods. Help us to find people in the wrong places who are looking in the uh, in the wrong places themselves for the help that they need looking to the wrong people looking to the wrong gods looking to the wrong influences help us to be there for them help us to bring your truth for in Jesus name we ask it amen that's our chapel for this morning again thank you for being with me and we'll see you again soon